This is Changing Channels with Larry Walsh, the channelnomics podcast that connects you with channel chiefs, thought leaders, and executives about what it takes to get the next generation of tech to market. Here's your host, Larry Walsh, the CEO and Chief Analyst of Channelnomics. Hey, thanks everyone for joining us again on Changing Channels. As they said, I'm Larry Walsh. Um, I think I've been at this for longer than I care to admit. Um, You know, when I first came, true story, when I first started in technology, they asked me about digital signatures and I thought that meant scanning them. And then they started, I literally did that once on a job application, scanned my signature and saw it was a digital signature. Um, But they kept talking about data being the future that this was all going to be about, you know, data driving everything. And then that's morphed. We've all heard the expression that, you know, data is the fuel of business. It's the replacement of oil for making things run. Um, You hear it all the time about the need for digital transformation. You know, the, the point that all of the technology companies are pushing this message is that they want the businesses, the downstream customers to adapt more digital capabilities, more application based processes, um, more automation. Uh, And that's a great message because ultimately it is about driving a better customer experience. And for the businesses that are driving this or adopting digital transformation, it's about creating better, more efficient processes and more effective outcomes. Um, Surprisingly, the technology industry is not very good at that. You know, we, and particularly the channel is not very good at that. Uh, we've been doing work on this for a couple of years. We've been working with a number of different companies trying to uh, help facilitate that digital transformation message, uh, talking about how do we get more out of the go-to-market processes by leveraging data. And partners are not not well equipped for that. And again, vendors, even though many of them that are doing the transformation or offering the infrastructure and applications aren't actually doing a really good job of it themselves. Um, One of the things that has been impressive for me over the last year is watching what's been happening at HP. And HP in November launched their new uh, Amplify program in which they made data sharing and collaboration between them and their partners a cornerstone of the go-to-market motion. You know, and some of the things that HP is doing is truly, uh, you know, leading out, you know, particularly amongst many of, and I hate to, you know, date HP with this and calling it a legacy com- a legacy vendor, but it is one of the stalwarts of Silicon Valley. Um, it really is taking a leadership position and in, in making data a part of the partner process. And that's why I invited our friend, Mary Beth Walker, the head of global channel strategy at HP to join us um, to talk about this, because I think it's been a, a rather remarkable journey and it's worth exploring and ensuring a bit more. So with that, Mary Beth, welcome to Changing Channels. Hey, Larry, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Well, you know, it's great to have you. And as I said, you know, and I should say up front that Channelnomics has been, you know, working with HP on the Amplify program. Um, it's been, and I truly say that it's been a journey for you because this is the the heavy labor has been all on you and your team in bringing Amplify and actually, dare I say, birthing Amplify. Um, why don't we start there? Is what what exactly is HP Amplify and what makes it different from what you were doing with Partner First prior to that? Sure. So HP Amplify is our brand new partner program. As you said, we announced it in November for commercial and we'll be adding uh, retail and distributors through the next year to the program. And basically what we started to see a couple years ago actually was that the current partner first program that we had at that point in time um, really had suited us extremely well to this point in time and for a mainly transactional you know, hardware business. But as we started to get more into services and subscriptions and contract business, um, there really were some things that the program didn't allow for that we needed to figure out how to basically conquer and work with partners together in those areas. So we started looking at a new program, which we actually said needed to be based on three things. Performance, which was, you know, what we had uh, typically been, most programs have been based on in the past as well as capabilities we added as a second pillar, 
and collaboration, as you mentioned, is the third pillar. The capabilities pillar really is for us to be able to ideally look at what are the things we think partners and HP need to mutually be successful at going forward to be able to uh, stay ahead in the market, to you know, remain competitive, and everything leads to the North Star of creating better customer outcomes. And so we look at capabilities right now, like digital capabilities, online capabilities, and services capabilities. But we wanted to build a framework that would allow those capabilities to change over time without us having to change the framework over time. And then the third pillar, as you mentioned, is data collaboration or data sharing, which is very new for our partners. And uh, But we, with the amount of business that we do through our partners, we really had a big missing piece with some of the customer data and information about how customers were using our products. And we knew that it was data that the partners had, the resellers had for the most part. And that we really needed to tap into to be successful, thinking that we could get to the customer outcomes that we want to in the future. Yeah, it, it, it's surprising to hear that, though, and because we would think that there is a certain degree of transparency in in that value chain, the market that you know that there is a you know you make product for the customer, the partner is bringing that product to market. Why do you, you know, what, why was that missing piece missing in the first place? Well, you know, we've always been able to, again, run a more transactional business, more like, um, I call it like a relay race with the partners, you know, it was a pass the baton. So we would create the products, create the uh, go to market offerings and be able to pass them off to the partners, and then they would be able to take that to market with other value-added services that they wanted to provide and be able to actually, um, you know, do that without a lot of interference for us, get that last, last part of the journey. And now we realize that with the importance of the customer journey, the predictability that the customer is expecting, that we needed some of the data that was in their hands for us to be able to really accomplish that. What do you, okay, so what kind of data are you looking for? And so what is it? Predominantly, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, no, so no, it's okay. Definitely, um, you know, the biggest piece is around customer name. And that being customer company name, not personal, you know, who did that PC or printer go to? Um, so it's the company name, the, uh, so the selling information for where the product is going and inventory information. So those are the major pieces of information that we're looking for. Yeah. And why is that though? I mean, what is it, what do you see as the ability? Because as I said, you know, we hear this all the time that, that yeah. you follow the data and it will lead you somewhere. And, and, I, and I remember, you know, one of your former CEOs, Mark Hurd, used to say, you know, in, you, if you interrogate the data long enough, you'll get an answer. You know, so it, is there an answer? Is there, you know, when you talk about a North Star, do you know what that North Star is? Or is this still like, are we looking for a moving North Star that can guide you forward? Well, I don't think the North Star itself is moving. I do think it's a journey. You know, I think that we we know some of the things that we want to do with data and uh, we could talk about those. Um, some of it is really the way that we uh, that I describe it is it's like a two sides of a coin. So one side of the coin is about being able to just run our business better. So there's things around compliance. There's things that we need to be able to better audit about where our products are going and uh, what you know the prices are that's being paid for them, those kinds of things, that we know that we need to run the business better, to be able to create better supply chain, better partner processes, all of those things. And then the other side is really about the customer outcome piece. And that's new for everybody in the last few years to the degree that it's really like managing how we go to market. And so we are doing some things as pilots with partners 
to be able to test out some hypotheses that we have. And we also think that, you know, partners, I mean, they're kind of lining up in some cases right now to do pilots with us because they have great ideas about what we could do with data if we put it together. You know, they have some, we have some. The power of putting both of those things together is really starting to shape up to be very powerful. Yeah, was this well received? You know, because when you talk about having missing pieces, um, it, it, I can only imagine because like we did see some of this with you is that there's a lot of partners out there that have some capabilities. Some partners have all, are quite advanced. Uh, and then there's some that are just completely oblivious to me. It's like, it, it's 2021 or the 15th month of 2020. Um, <laughs> it, it just won't end. Um, but <laughs> It, it always surprises me to see that there are actually partners out there that still don't have websites that are using, yeah. they're using Gmail as their, as their business email. Uh, you know, and mind you, a lot of them are mostly smaller partners, but there are large organizations that are seemingly, you know, digitally savvy or at least technically savvy that are doing some really, you know, you know, let's say I'm trying to be kind here, mystifying things in, in the realm of, of, digital assets and digital tools was it a miss did, did did they see this as the mystery that you saw it as well um it's been a journey uh, quite a journey through that and again it really depends on where the partners were there's uh, i would say the majority of the partners you know you sit down and you talk to the ceos no matter whether they're big or small they see the value in data sharing they didn't necessarily see um, how we were going to get there. And there was a lot of questioning of what are you going to do with our data? Now, because it was a journey and we were introducing this new program that we knew had to have that foundation for collecting data, we started to ask for data before we had a lot of answers for them on what we were going to do with it. And we've spent a lot of time the last six months really working through that. And as it's become more and more clear to the partners how we will use data, and because uh, it was no insignificant piece of it, we really had to prove to them that we were gonna be very careful and thoughtful about the security of their data about the privacy of the data, who has access to it, even when it's in HP. Of course, they had questions about, you're not gonna give my data to another partner. How do I know that? Um, and so we had to you know, show them and prove to them that that was off the table. Those were table stakes for us to be able to, to do everything in a way that that wasn't gonna be an issue. And yeah. then we could really start working on what are we gonna do with the data? And we've actually come up with kind of three buckets of um, the ways that we will use data and give it back to the partner. Because the intent is at the end, we're giving it back to them. Okay. Oh. And so we so, put it in three buckets. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, so finish your thought on that because I want to okay. get into that a little bit more. Okay. So the first bucket is really around descriptive data. And so this is where we take like, partner KPIs, benchmarking, trends, and we're able to combine it and enrich it with uh, profiling and performance data. So that for instance, a partner in Germany can see how their print sales are doing compared to all the other partners in Germany, things like that. So that's the descriptive part. Um, and there's some performance things about where they are with us that we're able to share and give back to them as well in that category. Then the second category is what we call predictive. And this is where we take data that they've given us, we add data that we have and data that we buy, okay? And we're able to look at things like the customer purchase propensity, um, what their buying patterns are, the kinds of things that we think they're likely to respond to if you bring it to them. Um, so those kinds of things go into the predictive category. And then the third category is prescriptive. And this is kind of the money category. Um, this is, you know, being able to create suggestions for them to act on, whether it be renewal campaigns, 
uh, cross-sell, upsell campaigns or opportunities, and things like inventory actions. So they would be able to say, you know, we see this trend where we always seem to have a surplus of this particular product. And now we're seeing that really customers are buying this other product that we never have enough in inventory, you know, it, when we need it in the third month of the quarter or something like that. So the, the prescriptive part is not necessarily all campaigns and sales actions. They can also be things that will lead to internal efficiencies and operating changes that the partner might want to look at as well. Yeah. So when you're talking about building efficiencies, you're talking about for it's a mutual benefit. It's not just one sided. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the nice things um, that we were talking to a partner about last week was when we were showing them some of the data that we'll give back to them and some of the analytics, you know, they said, you're going to actually save us time because some of what you're going to give to us, we have people spending time on now. And if we're, your, we're going to get it from you, we can take those people and move them to, you know, working more on campaigns or other things in the business, because you're actually going to create value for us and save us on labor, which was just awesome to hear. Yeah. You know, I want to come back before we lose sight of this, because you do go to great pains in this to talk about, you know, protecting the data in the partner interest. And I, I, there's two parts to this, and let's take the first one about the security of it, because there has been incidents recently um, that partners have been complaining about vendors encroaching on their customers. That they do like there's data sharing going on already. That's not you're not completely removed. From, the vendors aren't completely removed from the customers, uh, but there have been incidents really where the partners have been complaining about vendors calling down to their customers. Yep. and offering promotions, offering services. Um, how, do you, how do you get around that with your partners? Because particularly this one, this is a, this is a new set of a, a greater depth of, of data than they're used to sharing with you. Yeah, so um, the, um, at first, you know, the thing is we've, we have a good track record to be able to stand on um, and would like to believe that we've built a lot of trust with our partners around the fact that that's not our business model. That's not our MO. That's not, you know, what we do. Uh, we depend on partners to be integrated into every seam of our go-to-market that there is. Now, does that mean there's not bad behavior once in a while and, you know, some rogue things that might happen? Maybe, maybe not, you know, so um, that's possible. But at the same time, um, we also, you know, so we can't just depend on our um, strategy there, but we also, you know, we can, um, we've talked to partners about how we've gone through looking at, you know, we've basically said it's the customer's choice. Unless a customer comes to us and says that they want us directly involved versus via a partner, we won't do that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, is this, do you find that this is accelerating? Do you find that this is accelerating their own digital transformation? Because it's, it's got to take there's got to be an investment here of being able to, for them to not only recognize the data they have, but collect new data to organize it, to share it with you. How does that process work? So um, we've, we have pretty extensive training that we go through with them. And, you know, we've made a lot of changes in updates to our um, operating processes to be able to actually scale ourselves, to be able to, um, manage the um, actual volume of the number of partners that we're trying to bring on and the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, but the partners are sometimes, um, some of them are more well-equipped than others to be able to handle all of this. And we're working with them to really, you know, walk them through time after time, partner by partner and what it's going to take. The smaller partners, absolutely, they have more issue with it than the larger partners. 
And, um, you know, we're just doing the, the best that we can partner by partner to try to get through that. Yeah. You know, Mary Beth, I, I, I want to ask you, because this is one of these things you, you, you're, you're reacting. HP is reacting to change, yep. but you're also looking forward to the future. Um, let's call it out for what it is, is that there are companies out there that are, you know, call them born in the cloud. We won't call out anyone in particular. Uh, they have a lot of data at their, at their, uh, a lot of data at their, at uh, the available to them. Um, do you see this as leveling the playing field? Is that, is, you know, you talk about, you know, building efficiencies about creating these synergies with the partners, but does this help level the playing field with those emerging and disruptive uh, companies that are both operating in and around the channel that are affecting you and your partners? Well, I hope so. In a way, you know, I think that that's absolutely something that um, we intend to be a, a, you know, a consequence of all of this. Um, I think that that we're really trying to focus on what we need for our business, though, and as much as anything else. And we feel like we want to invest in the partners who are willing to invest in us. And, you know, this data sharing effort is really a big part of, you know, what we think we need to be successful. And that's why we're going after it. Yeah. Where do you, I, I, look, I've, I've watched, I've come on part of this journey with you. Uh, I believe HP is on the leading edge in developing these collaboration capabilities with partners that go well beyond uh, what traditionally is done in the, you know, both in the vendor to, partner organization between the vendors, uh, you know, account managers and the partners, people on the street. Um, do you think though, you know, is this something that you think is going to be become standard within the channel over time, you know, that HP is out on the leading edge of this, but do you think that this is what, we're, what you're going to see amongst all the companies that look like HP? I totally do. I think this is where we'll see everybody go. I don't know how anyone can really, you know, um, really, think that they know end to end what's going on in their customer journey and be able to react to it and have the, you know, analytics to be able to act on it and keep what they know is needs to be predictable with the customers in their mind. Um, so I think it absolutely is. Now, you know, we're in a different position than um, new born in the cloud companies. They already have all of it. Companies like Microsoft who have moved to more, you know, um, cloud services, they have the data, they have access to it. So we really are in a way different position in that we don't have it, you know, and we have to go and get it to be able to make sure that we can put that full picture together. Yeah, yeah. I want to change gears on you because I, I think that, you know, as as fascinating and as, as valuable as your data, your data and collaboration initiatives have been under Amplify. Um, I'm also impressed by what you've recently announced, which you're calling Amplify Impact uh, for sustainability. Can we just spend a couple minutes talking about what yeah, HP is sure. doing with sustainability? Yeah, we're so excited about Amplify Impact. So um, as many people may be aware, you know, we are one of the leading technology companies in the sustainable uh, impact arena. Uh, we've actually said that we wanna be number one technology company by 2030 in this area. And we've invested, you know, just millions and millions of dollars into this area. And when we looked at what's the, you know, what are some of the ways that we can really expand our reach and really go to the next level? We said, we have to include our partners for a couple reasons. One is we have to, over time, make sure that we are dealing with partners who are dealing with sustainability, that they not only have plans, but that they are able to stand up to why their uh, customers should create preference for HP based on the sustainability that we build into our products and services. They also need to have a sustainability plan for their company. It's becoming not only more important to customers, but to employees as well, and 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 investors. You know, um, the, there's like over 800 investors now who look at the CDP rankings when they decide what companies to invest in. 
that's just a huge, huge statement going forward and where things are going. But we also said, you know, we have a lot of small partners who they don't have the money that we do. They don't have the resources that we do to invent their own training for their employees, to be able to create their own programs and collaterals for initiatives around recycling and things like that. So why wouldn't we share with them what we've done and what we've already invested in and put our money into? So uh, we just are so excited about the program. We rolled it out a couple of weeks ago now. Um, the goal is for us to have half of our Amplify partners on the program by 2025, um, but we've gotten out of the gates really strong. The interest has been phenomenal, and we really look forward to, you know, continuing to enrich the program and enrich what it, we're able to offer to partners through the program. Do, do you find, though, that partners need convincing that sustainability is a value proposition? So it depends on the country. Yeah. You know, um, we actually did some work and we divided countries into different categories, those that are already on the leading edge, those that want to be there and have gotten started, those that want to be there but don't really know where to start, and then those that don't think it's important yet. And so what we've actually done with uh, Amplify Impact is pick the uh, partners who want to be there and really have passion for it but don't know where to start is one of our starting points. And so in six countries right now, we're running a pilot where we will actually go out and help partners who don't have a sustainability plan for their company yet, we'll help them build it. So there's extensive training that we have. We have tool sets for them, templates for them to use, you know, all kinds of resources that we're bringing to bear for them to, within a year, we're given a 12 month window to work with us and try to come up with something for their company that they actually can write their first sustainability report about next year, regardless of how sophisticated it might be or how in depth, but we're, we want to get them started. So yeah, at the end so of this year, we want to be able to say we helped X hundred more partners have a sustainability plan for their company that didn't when we started. So not to not to paint myself as cynical because i i have this conversation this debate with my wife my wife is huge on you know my wife's in the fashion industry she's huge on sustainability it's a big topic within the fashion industry but it still feels like a nice to have you know it's like it's it's because it's hard to unless there's a true economic return for sustainability it's hard to justify some of the expenses so how do you talking to your peers you know, you know, that are looking at their channel programs and their partners, how do you justify sustainability, the expense and the effort that goes into sustainability within your channel program? Well, so a couple of things. Um, it's a great question, you know. So first of all, uh, it's important to them as a company because uh, employees are voting on where they go to work based mm -hmm. on the sustainability uh, values of that company. And we're seeing that more and more, you know, so it makes a difference to their workforce. Um, I mentioned, you know, over 800 investors looking at CDP ratings before they decide what companies they're going to invest in. That's a pretty big statement going forward. And, you know, so it shows the kind of importance as a company to pay attention to this. And then last but certainly not least is customers and customers expect the brands that they're going to put their money into and that they're going to stand behind have a good sustainability story and are able to really, you know, um, show that they are sustainable products and what they're doing to create, you know, um, what we need in the future in the environment. Yeah. Mary Beth, these are great conversation. I'm really looking forward to having you back again in the future so we can talk see because you're still in the early days of amplify uh still you know looking at how the impact is and how it's working and the same thing with uh with the impact sustainability program but now it's time to turn to our final five okay. so you know everyone just as you, just a reminder this is there we go just so everybody knows is that, you know, our final five is just, you know, a few fun questions. Mary Beth, like all of our other guests, never seen these questions, doesn't know what we're going to ask her. So, you know, her, her responses are authentic. So Mary Beth, you ready for your final five? 
I think so. Okay, just remember, we are keeping score. So, <laughs> uh, so look, first question, what do most people get wrong about the channel? Wow. Um, I didn't expect it to be hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, that it's either the channel or not the channel, like that it's either, you know, that things are either direct or they're through your channel and that that's not at all the way that it works. Yeah, you know, it's it's surprising. We, you know, it, again, doing this for a long time, still surprised that we still have to explain this. You know, yeah. that's, you know, that it's something that so many companies say that they are dependent on and yet they still can't define it. Okay. So if you could have dinner with one person from history, who would it be? Uh, Lincoln's wife. You know, that Mary is so Todd Lincoln. Okay. I'm going to ask why. Well, you know, because um, I actually, one of the things that I like in my, is a hobby is to read not only about presidents, but about their wives and the impact that their wives had. And uh, she in particular was just such a force behind him and him having the courage to do some of the things that he did and actually kind of the gumption to actually even run for president. And uh, so she was so strong and for a woman of, you know, that time, she just had such um, power behind helping him that I just think she's a fascinating woman. I, you know what? You're absolutely right. The correct answer was Lincoln. So we're going to allow this answer. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. You know, what's your go-to metric for measuring channel performance? Uh, I think that there's two things. One is... Uh, the channel performance itself, it would be around, you know, are we able to enable partners to be successful creating the customer outcomes that we want? And there's a different, a bunch of different ways you can measure that, but that's actually what, you know, would want to get at. Um, the other thing is just the ability to get things done. Like, can we really, do we have an environment where we can move the ball forward? Um, whether it's with operational processes, being easy to do business with, product services and offerings, all of the above. Okay. Are pineapples acceptable on pizza? Absolutely not. That's the correct answer. Thank you, Mary Beth. All right. And last question. What advice would you give to someone starting in the channel, aspiring to have your job one day? Um. You know, I think that there's uh, the probably the most important thing is, you know, keep your eye on uh, two things because they're the only things that really matter. One is the customer experience, which is the be all end all, but you can't have a good customer experience without a great partner experience. So really being able to blend those two things into you know, an equation that gets you the growth that you want, I think is really important. But the partners have to be willing to stick with you, work with you, you know, wanna do business with you, think that you're important to them growing their business. And we have to continue to work really, really hard on making sure that that partner experience is at the level that we need it to be. I, you know what? I agree with you. The partner experience is paramount. Um, it's you can't have a good customer experience without a good partner experience. Absolutely. So anyway, oh, there's that phone again. There must be another customer calling. Got to get that sale. So Mary Beth Walker, head of global channel strategy at HP. Thank you so much for joining us here on Changing Channels. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining Changing Channels with Larry Walsh, a production of Channelnomics, with the support of our production team at Modern Podcasting. If you've enjoyed today's episode, hit the like button, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and share with your friends. For more information about Channelnomics services and insights, follow us on Twitter and YouTube, and check out our website at channelnomics.com. Channelnomics is a registered trademark of and Changing Channels is copyright by 2112 Enterprises, LLC.